Hello and welcome to our study of the intertestamental period on this Wednesday evening. Um, we said last week that we would begin with the Maccabean period, which covers from about 166 to 63 BC. Uh, we had some write and ask about uh, where they could get information on this. Well, the way the internet is now, uh, you can get about as much as you want on the intertestamental period that uh, anybody could uh, ever study and more detail than we care to go into here because of our purposes. You could spend um, a semester in a course just on the intertestamental period if it was set up as a college offered course. But we're not interested in that. We're simply trying to bridge the gap between Malachi and Matthew, a period of 400 years. And we noticed as we closed out last uh, week that Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, had struggled as a Seleucid with the Ptolemies and um, had actually about defeated the Ptolemies in Egypt for control of, of Palestine. But the Romans had become powerful enough to where they began to exert their force in the Eastern Mediterranean. And thus they stopped that. And he became so enraged, that is Antiochus Epiphanes, that remember we said last week that for a period of about two years, he plundered Jerusalem and destroyed many things there and enslaved many and stopped the act of circumcision and stripped the temple of its treasures and desecrated the temple by sacrificing a sow on the holy altar. And that was around December 16th of 167 BC. You can read of that in the apocryphal book of First Maccabees 1, 54 through 64, as well as Second Maccabees chapters 5 through 7. I'll have a little more to say about apocryphal books later on. But this brings us to what we call the Maccabean period of 166 to 63 BC. Antiochus IV demanded that shrines to Greek deities be built throughout Palestine and that swine be offered as sacrifice on them. Now, you must remember that Antiochus, being a Seleucid, thus coming from Seleucus, one of the generals of Alexander, was as determined as was Alexander to Hellenize, to get things done the Greek way in all the world. Remember, Alexander thought that the way to unite everybody is to get everybody agreeing to and living according to Greek culture. But if we'll just recall to mind how the faithful Jew under the law of Moses felt about anything that was contrary to the teaching of the law, then you can see how that, that would sit with a great many Jews at this time in Palestine. Now, when he set up these shrines and wanted to offer the swine in various parts of uh, Palestine, some of his agents went about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem to a little village of Modin, M-O-D-I-N, and tried to force a priest named Mattathias to offer a sacrifice. Well, this priest refused to do so, but another Jew of the city agreed to do it and performed the rite. Mattathias had five sons. He and those five sons killed the Jew who did what he did in offering this pig as sacrifice. Not only did they kill him, they killed the Seleucid general who ordered that it be done, and they killed several soldiers. Well, they knew immediately where that put them as far as the Seleucid kings were concerned, and Antiochus Epiphanes. So they 
as we would say today, headed for the hills. They fled up into the hill country, Palestine, and began operating a guerrilla warfare. You can read of this in 1 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 1 through 70. Well, one year later, after all of these events, Mattathias died, and the leadership of the movement passed to his son Judas. His uh, name was Maccabeus, and it can be translated in Hebrew or from Hebrew into hammer, as he's basically known in history as Judas the Hammer. It can also be translated the destroyer. Be that as it may, that's how it's come down to us as Judas Maccabeus or Judas the Hammer. And what's interesting about him, to sum it all up, he, he was a very brilliant leader. In fact, he led this revolt and he gained Jerusalem. And upon regaining the city, he built a new altar. He went about refurbishing the temple and he rededicated it to the Lord on December 14th, 164 BC. The daily sacrifices were begun again, according to 2 Maccabees chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. Now, we've all heard, I think, of uh, Hanukkah, meaning the Feast of Lights, Hanukkah. That is an annual Jewish festival, which actually celebrates this event of the refurbishing and reopening of the temple and everything being done again in the temple according to the law of Moses. Well, he fought to eliminate all Syrian influence. As we say, that was the Hellenistic influence, and he sought to destroy it as far as it impacting the homeland of the Jews. And this continued until Judas's successors finally secured a treaty with Rome, which all the time was growing in power, and that was in 139 B.C. And at this point, there was established a new ruling dynasty in Palestine. And you may have heard of this, but it's simply known as the Hasmonean, the Hasmonean dynasty. The priests at this time period and over the next several years became quite wealthy and powerful. And I hope if you'll remember what you run into in the life of Christ, reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the status of the priests at that time. Civil disorder and military weakness under the Hasmoneans finally led to the Roman takeover of Palestine in 63 BC under Pompey the Great. Pompey and Julius Caesar and Crassus would form the first triumvirate. Of course, they all fell out with one another, and that's another story indeed, because Julius Caesar ends up becoming the one standing out front of all of them. But as far as what happened in Judea, Jerusalem, Galilee, or Palestine in general, the Maccabees and all of the rule of the Maccabees went through the various brothers succeeding one another. But the Maccabees and what's called the Hasidim and Hellenists, those oriented toward still trying to create Greek cultures and unifying force in that part of the world, um, develop into, they were of the early Maccabean period, but they had developed into the Hasmoneans, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees basically championed the Greek way of life. And we know from our study of the life of Christ how strict Pharisees were. And it lets you know why that they were so determined to come up with all sorts of traditions that would guarantee they would not violate the law. But in reality, they held their traditions above the law. And that's why Jesus would say to them, 
in vain you do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So the Pharisees actually developed into not upholding the law and the law alone and acting strictly by the authority of Moses, but they developed their own uh, system of traditions. And that's what they bound on people. And they developed into what we see of them as hypocrites and so forth in the life of Christ. Now, we move from that, although I suggest if you love to read that kind of stuff, there's a lot more about the Maccabees and the details of what went on, and you can uh, pursue that elsewhere. But we want to move from this, because now remember, we've got the Romans dominating the thing. And so they're dominating Palestine. And this began in 63 BC, as I said, when Pompey the Great captured Jerusalem. Now, of course, by this time, Roman civilization, Roman ways of doing things, and they appreciated power and might above and beyond about anything control the whole of the Mediterranean world. And all of the New Testament literature came into being under the uh, Roman Empire and in the Roman Empire. One thing that's interesting about the Romans is that they did not superimpose uniform governments on the territories that they conquered. In fact, they may come into a place that really fought to the death to keep them from taking over and then tell them, once they had put it in a common way, stomp their enemies into the ground, that now if you'll be good and be loyal to the Roman Empire in 70 years or whatever, we will grant you Roman citizenship. I pause here to say, though, there's no evidence where we could be at all conclusive that you'll remember when Paul told the captain of the guard in Jerusalem when he had been rescued by the Romans from the Jews that he was a Roman citizen. And the captain said, well, with a great sum, I obtained this. But Paul said, I was freeborn, which meant that somewhere in Paul's background, in his family, somewhere or the other, they had already obtained Roman citizenship. And that gets rather interesting to see uh, just on what grounds the Romans would grant Roman citizenship. So this is the way the Romans operated. They let the people go ahead and have their religions. They let them run their own show locally. What they would not tolerate one little bit would be any semblance of rebelling against the empire. Sedition was what would get you nailed to a cross. I would remind you that that inscription placed above Jesus' head as he was nailed to the cross declared that this is the king of the Jews, and it declared it in Greek, Latin, and what would be Aramaic. And that was simply what was reserved, that is crucifixion, for those who were uh, rebelling against the empire. And this would allow Pilate to say, see, I have protected Caesar's interest because I put to death this man who was claiming to be a king. Because Pilate, as did many of the people of that time, were pretty good mentors for politicians today. Uh, by that, I simply mean, if you'll remember in his attempted interrogation of Jesus, he asked Jesus the question, what is truth? So truth to Pilate was simply whatever worked for him, basically. And that's what you see happening. Let's not lose sight of the fact that people then were moved by the same thing that moved people today. And people in positions like Pilate were moved by the same things that moves people in those positions today. So the political situation of Palestine after Rome took control reflects the general policy that we just said as to local rulers running their own affairs and religion going on as they wanted to do. But if there ever was a good description of big brother is watching you, uh, 
it was the Romans, only they would probably take it a step further. And uh, they would be not only watching you outside your house, but if they could, watching you in your house, all with one thing in mind. You dare not even begin to sow any kind of discord that would be a rebellion against the peace of the empire. So this business is said in Latin, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was a real thing to them. And they kept it by their power. If there's anything the Romans magnified, it was power. Now, I find that quite interesting because when you read the life of Christ and you come to Mark's account of the gospel of Christ, read it sometimes with the reality in mind that he wrote for the Romans. And you will see that Mark will emphasize the authority and power of Jesus Christ on earth in every aspect of it in proving that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. So you might want to do that sometime in your study of the Bible. Now, when it comes to the first one that Pompey set up over that area of the world, that uh, it was Antipater that he put into the position of authority. But Antipater, Antipater was not a Jew. He was an Idumean, and he was not popular because of his position. But like so many of these people who got to that point, he was a very shrewd man, and thus he was a manipulator, and he didn't mind shifting his allegiance as it served his purposes under the succeeding Roman generals. So in all of that, his machinations, he was able to consolidate his power and his position. And he began what we know in the New Testament as the Herodian dynasty. And you know how prominently that figures in in the study of the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. Well, at Antipater's death, guess who comes on the scene? Herod the Great. This man comes to power, and he rules as king of the Jews with the blessing of the Roman emperor, who is at this time Augustus, 37 B.C. to 4 B.C., well, he was a typical ruler at that time. He was ambitious, but he was a very great builder. And so he set about to renovate the temple and refurbish it. And uh, it might be noted that it was Herod's temple that Jesus was in and that it was only completely finished 10 years before the Romans came and destroyed it. So when Jesus was on the earth and the early meetings of the church in the temple, then it was still being worked on, but usable. This man was a suspicious, cruel, and ruthless person. Nothing else, the massacre of the infants uh, certainly proves that. But now we say, oh, how terrible he was. Well, there's umpteen others, if you want to use that terminology, at that time in his position over various petty kingdoms who would have done the same thing. And if you just study about the royal household, if better way to put it, I don't know, of Rome, and uh, if there ever were machinations and political intrigue and vying with one another, and ruthlessness, lies, and cheating that had happened in among the Caesars. At Herod's death, Palestine then was divided among three of his sons, Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus. These are the men that uh, we tend to read about in the uh, book of Acts, although they're mentioned. 
in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Archelaus reacted against uh, so violently by the Jews. In other words, they just didn't think well of him at all, and that's putting it mildly, that Rome stepped in and removed him from power and took away his control of the territory, which was Judea and Samaria, and thus placing it under a series of procurators. A general overview of life under the Roman Empire brings these things out. This is points that need to be kept in mind, for this is the state of affairs when we come across John the Baptizer, the forerunner of Christ, and Christ in his earthly ministry, and the early church there in Jerusalem, as you read of it, Acts. The world was at peace at the time of the coming of the Messiah. It was the Roman peace as we have described it. There was constant, as I've already said, intrigue. There was all manner paranoia and suspicion and fear that permeated the Roman emperor's palace. There was widespread poverty in the Roman world while there was still great riches. Most everything that the Romans did was designed to bring money riches into the government's pockets. This is one reason that they sought to continue to wage war as long as they could in conquering territories because they would get the plunder and the soldiers would get a part of that. Slavery was common in the empire, with one exception, and that is Palestine. It was not there. There were more slaves in the Roman Empire than there Of course, you know the, that polytheism was the rule among the citizens of the Roman world, but again, with one exception, in Palestine. The morals were low, but non-existent among all of the Romans and Greeks, and that had been going on for a long time in the Greek culture. And it was especially so in the emperor's court. But it was all the way through and permeated the whole of the empire. I think it's interesting to know that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, which means it was the fullness of time to start the church and to send the church out in the Great Commission. Well, why choose something like this when the world is not only immoral but amoral and they have no knowledge? unless they knew a Jew of the God of the Bible. And the Jews are very much in the minority of the whole Roman Empire. Well, if nothing else, God was intending to show the power of the gospel. And that's why Paul wrote in that letter to the Roman church that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation unto all of them that, are, that believe in him, the Jew first and also the Greek. So it was a time while the world was set so that the gospel could travel in one language all over the empire, the Roman system was as good a highway system as has ever been on the earth. Thus, they could travel easily. The Romans had established a peace on earth, and thus they could travel in relatively safe circumstances. And then, of course, the Greek language that we pointed out that was spoken virtually by everyone and thus took the name Koine, which means common Greek. And in it, the New Testament was written. So this is uh, the way that we have tried to set the scene from the way it was when Malachi finished his work and how it got to the state of affairs it was when we begin to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the life of Christ and in the empire in which the church was established and the gospel spread. Now, this, of course, can go on and on into studying more of the history that has come down to us. But I think it's good to realize that from heaven's viewpoint, as we know the Bible, 
regardless of all these things that went on in the Roman Empire, that history was moving forward purposefully. It says God is in control. How should we look at things today the same way? We look at government. We look at the various kinds of governments in the world. We see all kinds of upheavals and this, that, and the other. We see this nation embracing all kinds of immorality, such stuff. But God hasn't lost control. I think we in the church sometimes lose sight of the fact that we wield the sword of the Spirit in life and action. And that when we see these challenges come in the form of departure from the morals of the Bible, they ought to be looked at as opportunities to teach the truth. I say that because think of how Paul appeared before the Jewish council, Felix, Festus, then King Agrippa, who was a Herod, and later he appeared before Caesar. Now, what was that to Paul? For he was a prisoner. He was without his freedom. Paul looked at it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. And I have no doubt of what he said when he defended himself before Nero. Well, he would have been emperor at the time that he got to plead his case as a Roman citizen, having appealed to Caesar, which they had the right to do before Nero. How can I know what he said to Nero? Because I can read what he said in defense of himself, the Felix and the Festus and Agrippa. And the truth is the truth is the truth. Therefore, he would have done the same thing when he stood before Nero. We know that he had converts in Caesar's household, which also is translated the Praetorian Guard, that select guard that was Caesar's own bodyguard. So Paul looked at all of these things, even his being a prisoner, as an opportunity to teach the truth. We've often pointed out while Paul is Acts, Luke leaves him in the closing of the book of Acts as living in his own hired house and the Romans allowing people to come and go to visit him, but that he was a prisoner in that house and that he also was chained to Roman soldiers. Well, imagine what Paul would do when he had the, that captured audience. Who was prisoner of whom? Well, you know Paul would have done his best to convert that soldier everybody else that came about him. All we have to uh, do to know that is see what he did throughout his work. The time of anticipation when it comes to the Messiah coming and all the Messiah would do, when you read of the time between the Testament and you see the opening teaching that's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the time of anticipation was nearing its end. And the time of fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning the Christ was coming near, drawing near. So while we could continue on in details, in fact, it's fascinating just to read the, the, about the Maccabeans and to read about each one of them and their part in detail in the governing of uh, Judea in that area after they threw off the Seleucid uh, rule. But you get the point that we're trying to make here. All of this figured in to God's providential care of bringing Christ into the world and thus the church and the gospel at the exact time in history. God just doesn't do things haphazardly. God is in control. As he told Daniel, he sets up whomsoever he will. So while on, in the short run, it may seem that things aren't being done like God wants it. In the long run, it's all done according to the plan of God. That's one of the benefits of the book of Revelation, to see that when all is said and done, and this world is over and done with, and the judgment takes place, and heaven and hell are realities for all people who ever lived on this earth, then God's will is done. Now, we can have the attitude of 
I'll obey God out of a loving heart and faith in his system, and God's will is going to be done. Or I could have the attitude of not believing in him and rebelling against him and fighting against him and rejecting his gospel, and God's will will still be done, but I'll be punished for not loving and obeying. So we close this part of our study of the period between the Testaments, though it's been very brief and only a survey, by showing us that even when Revelation stopped, as far as the Old Testament was concerned, that it didn't mean that things prophesied in the Old Testament wasn't carried out in that 400 years, which things had been predicted, especially in the book of Daniel, down to the time in which Christ came into the world. Now, a little bit said about the apocryphal books. The word ap apocrypha carries with it the idea of something is secret. And that's what is meant by these books. Now, I said, I think last week when I mentioned this, that the Jews did not consider them to be a part of the Old Testament canon. If you look at the writings, you'll see that Christ never referred to any of them as being scripture. The Jews never considered them as being scripture. And they were put in at different times into the LXX of the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation made in 250 of the Hebrew Old Testament, but they were not always in those translations. But Jesus never used them, and yet they would have been, that is, the LXX, would have been the Bible of the Jews of the dispersion. And certainly the Christians didn't acknowledge them because the Jews didn't accept them. The Council of Trent much later on, when Roman Catholicism was, strive, it was thriving, decided they should go in the Catholic Bible. But they have never been accepted in Bibles produced by people like Luther or Calvin or those men who were of what is called the um, Protestantism. So time will not allow us to go into all the details on that, except I would read to you one particular thing from Josephus. Josephus said this of the Old Testament canon. Although so great an interval of time has now passed, not a soul has ventured to add or to remove or to alter a syllable, and it is the instinct of every Jew from the day of his birth to consider these scriptures as the teaching of God, to abide by them, and if need be, cheerfully lay down his life in their behalf. And his enumeration and description of these books show that they were the same as those that we know to make up the Old Testament today, those 39 books. And that's just one indication by a Jew who was not a Christian, but who was recording history at the time, what he said about his own people and the scriptures that were there. So we're going to read one more thing uh, from a fellow by the name of Bissell concerning the apocryphal books. And he said the Septuagint version becoming subsequent, subsequently to the great mass of Gentile Christians as well as to such Jews as did not understand Hebrew, the authoritative standard, the limits of the true original canon were almost wholly effaced. And in addition to the uncritical character of the period, the difficulty was, for a time, still further enhanced by the controversies carried on between the Jews and Christians which appealing to his own copy of the scriptures. The fact, too, that the early transactions of the scriptures into the vernacular of the people, like the old Latin, 
were made for the Septuagint, helped to fast upon and make hereditary in the church the Alexandrian confusion and mistake. What does he mean by the Alexandrian confusion and mistake? Well, so many of the departures of the early church and those that made the Sadducees what they were and not believing in angels or spirits of the resurrection came about because of the influence of Hellenism. And thus, these uh, books we know as the apocryphal books were greatly influenced in a lot of their teaching by these uh, Greek views. But when it comes down to those books recording history, such as the Maccabeans, and that's a different story. So these books take on, from book to book, a different uh, philosophy sometimes. So the best conclusion we can have from the Old Testament scriptures themselves and from Jesus' reference is that the apocryphal books simply were not a part of the Hebrew canon. And thus, we do not consider them to be the inspired word of God today. We'll let it go with that now. And I would suggest that you go ahead and pursue these studies. We'll know a lot more detail of them in this 400 silent year period. But for our purposes, we've covered that, I think, well enough. And when we get back to, hopefully in the future, our studies of the geogra geography of uh, Palestine, and um, you're able to see what we sent out through uh, Gary Blassingame's work to our members at Spring out of the book on uh, geography, the matter pertaining to the intertestamental or period or the silent 400 years, then hopefully they will give you a little more detail if you're that interested.